Today's guest brings magic to the page and beyond. Before becoming a best-selling author, she was a diplomat, a cooking show host, and even ran a business that turned kids' drawings into real-life stuffed animals. Now, she's known worldwide for her Gifted Clan series, where Korean mythology meets epic adventure. Her books have been celebrated in Time Magazine for Kids. Zooming all the way from New Zealand, please join me in welcoming New York Times best-selling author, Gracie Kim. Wow, that's such an amazing intro. Thank you. I was like, who that? <laughs> Gracie, could you tell us about any early inspirations that set you on the path to becoming an author? Was there a moment in childhood or story that sparked your imagination? You know, this is such an interesting question because I was actually thinking about, you mentioned before in my bio, I used to be a diplomat, right, for New Zealand. And I think it all stems from the same place. Like when I was really little, so I'm the I'm the eldest of three kids. And my two younger sisters are very different in personality and temperament. And I felt like I was kind of the bridge in between the two of them. My parents, the same, two very extremely different people. Um, and so I was always the bridge in between. And so I think I grew up kind of feeling like I was always the mediator or the connector um, because I felt like I could so clearly see both parts of <clears throat> of the situation, right? And so I think part of the reason I wanted to become a diplomat was bridging, bridging um, cultures and countries, so in terms of representing New Zealand. But I think that childhood experience also eventually later led me to want to be a writer because I think to write is also to bridge and to bring people together and to bring bring different perspectives to light. And so I think there wasn't one specific childhood memory, but I think it was that overall experience of being that person um, who could see all sides of the argument and was so frustrated because there was never one clear person in the right or the wrong. I think it's that thread <clears throat> excuse me, um, that led me to want to write. Um, in terms of a specific example, though, I have to say at primary school, so, you know, elementary school, I remember writing this um, assignment about, it was a creative writing piece about my family, and I wrote about my family. I was so proud of it, and I handed it in, and my teacher later said, hey, Gracie, this is an okay piece of writing, but I want to ask you, why did you describe your family as being blonde and blue-eyed? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I, I couldn't fathom the question, because I was a big reader, but I just, at that point had never read a book um, in English that had people that depicted my culture and my look. Do you know what I mean? And so I just assumed that it was one of those rules, like a grammatical rule, um, that in books, regardless of who you were in real life, in books you had to be white. Like I just thought it was a rule. And so um, I told my teacher as such, and she said, well, you know, if it doesn't exist, it just means someone hasn't done it yet. Like someone hasn't made it yet. doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means it hasn't been done. And at the time, I remember just kind of scoffing and laughing it off, being like, well, if you were right, it would exist by now, you know? It didn't actually register with me at the time, but it was only much later as an adult, looking back on that, that I realized that was a real big spark or kindle that allowed me to realize that I wanted to write because I had felt so invisible in books that I had loved and treasured growing up, and I really wanted to be able to center myself and kids like myself back onto the page because if you don't see yourself on the page, then um, the subconscious message we get is that we don't deserve to be the heroes of the stories, and we do. Your Gifted Clan series brings Korean mythology to life in such a vivid way. What drew you to Korean mythology, and are there any lesser-known myths or stories that especially inspired The Last Fallen Star? Oh, so... I grew up listening to random Korean myths and folk tales from my parents and my harmony, my grandma. And so it was kind of a part of my upbringing, I guess, naturally, just by oral storytelling, bedtime stories. Most of the time, the stories that I got told, I reckon, were ones that, you know, where kids would be stolen away by Tokebi goblins or the ghosts Kishin would come and, like, steal us away. There was, like, a general theme of kids being stolen away <laughs> um, if we would misbehave, you know. So I think it was mostly a way that my parents and my harmony 
we're trying to control us um, to make us behave. Um, but I think that's where the, the I guess, awareness um, and exposure to these stories came from. Uh, but again, I didn't realize that I could put my own spin on those later in life as books. I just didn't realize those were connectable. Those were two completely different things. These random stories my parents told me as bedtime stories to scare us and then books that I could produce later. Um, in terms of lesser known myths, you know, the interesting thing about mythology uh, the thing I love about mythology in particular and folklore is that they remain alive through the generations and across time by virtue of the freshness and the new ways in which new storytellers spin these tales. These, sta- these tales, they always change, right? They're never exactly the same. Depending on who tells it, depending on the region, depending on the society of the time, they're different. And so what I love about it is that I didn't have this stock standard Um, story that I had to follow I had these like kind of amorphous characters and amorphous vibes um and I could take that and put my own spin on them and so I think that's what I loved so much about creating the world of the gifted clans is that that I wasn't I wasn't restricted by any rules you know I'm even Greek mythology I feel like is so much more entrenched in the English speaking world that there are more expectations on how these stories should be told but I guess with Korean mythology because it has been lesser known in the English speaking world that I could kind of just go a bit creative with it and so to be honest to answer your question I don't know if there were any lesser known myths it's just they're my take on these myths and characters, if you will, um, spun in a way that I guess um, I felt was fun. <laughs> Is there a difference between Korean mythology and Greek mythology? Yes um, and no. I think yes, because um, different societies obviously value different things. And so I think the different types of stories and the different types of characters can vary somewhat. Um, also in Greek mythology, there's like a more established pantheon of gods, whereas um, in Korean mythology, there's, um, you know, different ideas of how the gods play with each other and fit together, but not necessarily an agreed pantheon of gods. Um, At the same time, I'm always fascinated by how many of these mythologies across cultures that perhaps don't have any or um, very little contact with each other can come up with such similar creatures and concepts. You know, like, there's always a horse that can fly. There's always some kind of bird that's like a human, Um, usually a woman, scorned. Um, There's like these elements you know what i mean that like different um mythology seem to share despite having been you know stationed on different parts of the world and hardly had contact which makes me think that at the core humans are we're, we're the same you know the things that plague us and the things that excite us and um, the things that hurt us um, and the things that give us hope i think are pretty universal your books have been called sparkling and magical but they also touch on deeper themes like identity and belonging. How do you balance the action-packed adventure with these important themes, and what do you hope young readers take away from it? Oh, you know, I think the most important thing um, when reading is it needs to be fun. Like, it just needs to be entertaining. Like, if you know, especially if you're writing books for young people, if you are trying, and it's obvious to the reader that you're trying to, like, secretly inject a message in there, I think... People know, you know, they're like, I don't want to have a lesson thrown at me this way. I just want to read a good book that is entertaining. So I think for me, that's the number one thing. I just want it to be fun. I want the experience to be fun. Um, In terms of these messages, it's I don't think that I try to inject these special messages in there. But by virtue of the characters that I'm creating, um, the character arc calls for learning right like a a story is essentially like all stories in the world regardless of whether it's a book or a movie or a show story is essentially a story of a a journey of a person who wants something who goes on this journey to get it faces a whole lot of problems and then changes as a result so they have to change so in order to change they need to learn something along their way and so because i have that character development always at the core and because my characters often stem from something that's important to me so the idea of belonging the idea of choice the idea of magic being all around us um 
I think these messages seep through through the character. So I guess if I have done my job properly, which maybe sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but I would love for readers just to have a good time and then by the end of it have learned something not by having a message shoved down their throat, but through living the life of the character, come to the same realizations that the character did. Um, and if I can give readers a sense of that, then I am a very, very happy writer. With Dream Slinger coming out next year, what can you share about this new series? Are there any themes or ideas you're exploring that feel different from the Gifted Clan series? Mm. Yes. So I think Dreams, actually, I have a little sample um cover there um i think with dream saying it's skew slightly older so the maybe the texture of the work is a little less kind of light and humorous and a bit more older so there is that um and thematically i think um there's definitely that core of feeling like you're on the outside or being treated like an outcast and wanting to belong um that part i think is such a strong part of who i am and what i believe that that's in there but I think there is a bit more in Dream Slinger about, about actually what I said before about there being no right and wrong. So there's a character in the book and she mentions um, a part way through about the concept. She coins the term, but she says um, buffet splaining. So buffet splaining is like um, if you go to a buffet, there's lots of food, right? But if you only put meat on your plate, you could call it a meat restaurant. Or if you only put seafood on your plate, you could call it a seafood restaurant. Or if you only put pasta on your plate, you could be a pasta restaurant. And that would be right. It wouldn't be incorrect. But if you actually take a step back and look at the bigger picture, the whole restaurant is a lot more complex than that. Um, And she uses that to describe the idea that when people react to their own circumstances and stories they always come at it with their own perspectives and they will take the the facts that fit their narrative right um but sometimes people aren't necessarily just clearly good and evil but people are a result of their circumstances so there could be two people who are both doing what's right in their eyes but they could be opposing forces and the other could see the other as evil because they're only looking at the facts that serve their case. Does that kind of make sense? So this whole idea of there being, um, there's always a choice and that there's always two or more sides of the situation and um, what is good and evil depends on where you are and what your circumstances are. This like really complexity of of there being, um, yeah, no clear right and wrong. Um, I think is something that is much stronger in Dream Slinger than I have in my other books. I think it harks back again to why I wanted to be a diplomat and why I eventually got drawn to writing because I feel like the world is so complex and there's, yeah, it depends. It just depends where you're standing and what your lived experience is. Um, That determines what we view as right and wrong. (laughs) With diverse books facing challenges today, what impact do you hope culturally rich stories like the Gifted Clan series have on young readers, especially in the face of censorship? Oh, look, censorship, banning books, it is just, it's its such a tragedy um, that it is happening and it is happening with such force. I just, it is, yeah, I mean, there's no other words. It's just a tragedy. And I think, the only way we can counter it really is just to keep producing more stories and keep talking about stories that bring lots of different people into the fore. Um, Because I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm just one, I'm just one writer writing my books. Um, But I guess the process of normalizing it, it's what I said before about growing up and not seeing yourself on the page shows that you are invisible. That's the message you take away over time is that we don't deserve to be the heroes. We don't deserve to be seen. We don't deserve to be on the page. Um, and that's just incorrect. <laughs> um, and so um, in the face of such a tragedy as this, I think we just keep producing. I mean, I know what I'll do. I'll just keep writing books, centering lots of diverse voices and diverse experiences and diverse cultures that are centered from my experience. Um, and I hope others continue to do so. Um, if you, I guess, over time, the thing that heartens me is that I think um, history ebbs and flows. 
And so perhaps one of the reasons we're having this reaction right now is because we had such a huge, um, like richness, like such a, like a bountiful sudden supply of these stories that we didn't have in the past. And so it's kind of pen- like a pendulum, right? Like because it suddenly swung so far that way, it has to swing a little bit more that way. But that just means it's going to swing back this way again. And maybe it's that constant swinging that keeps the balance of society going. So I don't know. I It's it's a, like I said, it's a tragedy. But as long as we just keep going and we keep producing these stories that center people from all walks of life, and not only people who are mirrored in these stories, but for all the people, because books are not just for the people that are on the page, you know, books are for everyone. That's the whole point. We can have all these experiences, all these adventures and magic and learnings through, through these books, you know? Um, And so I just hope that it just happens to be that we're at one extreme of the pendulum swing and that it's going to swing the other way very soon. And I hope we can all be a part of that swing the other way. Because these stories aren't going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. Um, we just have to keep sharing and telling our stories. Gracie, thank you so much for sharing your incredible journey and insights with us today. Your stories are extremely entertaining, and it's clear they offer readers not only adventure, but a deep connection to culture and identity. We can't wait for Dream Slinger and everything you have in store. Thank you again for joining us and for keeping the magic alive for readers everywhere. For having me. It's been it's been so much fun. Thanks.